I guess I, just to get a feel for uh, who you guys are and what your experience with AdWords is, so I can kind of tailor it. Um, who's used AdWords before out there? Okay, so some people. Um, everyone's like this. Anyone, anyone really good at AdWords? Okay. I've got about 34 slides. It, um, I'm going to apologize in advance. The last, the one that I'm following, the, the uh, academy uh, that I'm following, um, was on Design 101. And design is really sexy compared to AdWords. So um, it's, it'll be worth it, though. So we're going we're gonna to get into some math and stuff like that. I mean, design is, is for people, and AdWords is kind of for spreadsheets. So um, if you don't understand anything at all, or you want me to slow down or anything, just let me know. Throw a hand up. Ask questions. Uh, this is all here for everyone to learn. So. OK. <clears throat> is everyone familiar uh, with what uh, PPC is, pay-per-click advertising? Let's start real basic. Awesome. CPC. Yeah, it's, sometimes it's called cost per click. PPC is pay per click, same thing. Um, PPC is pay per click advertising, and this is an online advertising model where the advertiser pays only when someone actually clicks on their ad. They click on their ad and go to their website. As opposed to um, like CPM advertising where you pay per impression. So you pay X number of dollars for your ad to show a thousand times. Um, PPC, you only pay when somebody clicks on your ad. Um, why would someone want to use PPC? Um, for one, that's not up here, is uh, PPC is usually um, kind of used as a supplement to SEO, SEO search engine optimization, which is the organic rankings in Google. And <clears throat> SEO is really what you want to achieve because SEO is free traffic. Um, but SEO takes sometimes a long time to rank, depending on who your competition is. Um, uh, just to, to be, um, you know, for the search engine robots to go out and figure out what your site's about and index you and everything, um, it can take months. Whereas PPC, you can buy your way to the top of Google for a keyword today, and you can show tonight for a keyword and have traffic to your website. Um, so the big thing about PPC is um, you're only advertising to people that are looking for exactly what you have right now if you do it right. If you're selling red shoes, you can bid on the keyword red shoes and everyone that sees your ad is out there looking for red shoes, uh, which is a lot better than you know, just a billboard that's out there trying to draw their attention away from some other site or some article that they're reading. Um, these people are looking for what you have. You're just kind of connecting the, your good or service with a buyer. Um, another reason is you only pay when people respond. This is, a, I mean, it's a great advertising mechanism because, uh, you know, if you do the old school methods, like you put an ad in a newspaper, um, you really don't have any idea how many people flipped through and saw that that ad. If they if they read the whole thing, um, you know, if, if, how they felt about it, and with. With pay-per-click, you get a lot of data. Um, if someone is interested in, in your, if your ad piques their interest, then they click, and you can see that click. And then through Google Analytics, you can see on the site how much time they spent, what pages they went to, things like that. Um, and the last one is, is pricing is determined on, by an, an ongoing real-time auction. So there's a market out there. And um, I guess it, it's, it kind of levels the playing field um, because you can pay the same thing for ad space that a, a larger company, you can compete with a large company um, for the same ad space. Um, so uh, say you're selling, you know, you're selling books, you can actually, you know, Amazon's probably going to have the number one ranking organically, but you can go out there and for X number of dollars, you can buy the number one spot on Google if you really want to. All right. There are, Google is not the only PPC network out there. Um, these are the three big ones. Um, AdWords, which controls Google, the ads you see on Gmail, the video ads you see on YouTube. Um, Microsoft Ad Center, which is the second largest um, that controls ads on Bing and Yahoo. That's actually a merger that just happened back in uh, October. Um, a lot of people overlook this, but combined, they control about 30% of the search volume. So I do a lot of advertising on Bing and Yahoo, but we're not going to get into that tonight. Um, and the last one's Facebook, which is relatively new. They've been doing ads since about since 2007. And um, the, the model's a little different, the way you target. It's not based on keywords. It's based on people's interests and their age and where they live and things like that. So what is Google AdWords? 
Um, Google AdWords is a platform that allows advertisers um, to put ads both in search rankings, like if you type something into Google.com, and also into their content of or their their network of content sites. Um, I think CNN serves Google ads. There are tons of TechCrunch serves Google ads, um, so you can put ads out there. Um, and recently, you can put Google ads on YouTube, um, and you can pay both cost per click or cost per impression. Um, and one thing I wanted to highlight here is that people often uh, confuse Google AdWords and Google AdSense. And um, AdWords is, is the platform for advertisers, and AdSense is the platform for publishers. So if I'm advertising a product and I'm creating an ad, I want an AdWords account. And if I'm publishing a blog and I want to monetize that blog by hosting other people's ads, I want an AdSense account. So uh, today we're just going to concentrate on AdWords. So we're advertisers, we're advertising a product. Uh, how are we going to get it to our target market? All right, this is the Google Ad Network. We've got um, the search network, and this is kind of what, uh, you know, you see the, uh, my mouse does not show up on here. You see the, the ads in the top box, there are also ads down the right-hand side in the search network. Um, in the, uh, the display network, like I said, is where you've got, um, Publishers that have a blog or a news site or any kind of content site and, and they're monetizing their site by hosting your ads. And Google matches up your ad with, with themes in the content. And the last one is video ads, which are relatively new. Um, I feel like they're not that targeted, um, but uh, you can put an ad on the bottom of a YouTube video if you would like. Does anyone know what video that is on the right-hand side? Friday. That is Friday. Had to go. Yeah, I, I had. <laughs> I had to figure out a way to put Rebecca Black into this. And if you haven't seen it, go to YouTube and type in Rebecca Black Friday. And I, I promise, it is the worst song you will ever hear. <laughs> you what? No. <laughs> okay. And um, I recommend as a, as a beginning advertiser that you always start with the search network. And that's where I'm going to focus tonight. Does anybody know why um, I'd recommend that you start with the search network? as a beginning advertiser. Okay, um, think about kind of what the, the different types of customers that are out there and how they're coming into your website. A, if you are running an ad on display network um, and you're selling um, vintage footballs or something, you, your ad might show, Google might place it on like NFL.com or something like that. Um, Someone came to that site for another reason, not to buy vintage footballs. They're coming to read about you know, what happened in a game last Sunday. Um, you have to, your ad has to be really, really eye-catching to draw their attention away from the content that they're reading on the page. Um, to, yeah, to, to draw their, con their attention away from that. Um, the same thing with video ads. People came to, to see a video, you know, and, and the targeting, if you can see what's on this Rebecca Black video, which is a terrible music video about the day Friday. Um, is upside prepaid Visa card. People who are searching for Rebecca Black Friday, I, I don't know what small percentage are interested in getting a prepaid Visa card, but I can't imagine it's very high. Um, the benefit of the search network is if you're selling vintage footballs, you can bid on the keyword vintage footballs and, and it's likely that people are either looking for information about them or they're looking for where to buy them or how much they cost, but the people that are, that are searching on the search network are more likely to be buyers than on these other networks. So you'll have a better click-through rate for your ad usually in the search network. Okay, so in the search network, this is the anatomy of results page. I'm sure you guys have all seen a Google results page. Um, the, that top bar is the, the search query bar, and in this case, um, the search term is <coughs> CD conversion service. This is actually for a company called Rip Styles, which is a, another anchor company in Gangplank, and he's not there right now. But uh, they, they're a service that when people get a, an iPod, they've got, you know, a thousand CDs, you ship all your CDs to them, they rip all those CDs, they put them on your iPod, they ship the iPod and your CDs back. Um, so their CD conversion, CD conversion service is one of the things that they wanted to rank for. Um, and th this, is, this is what comes back in this page. Actually, the ad that I wrote for them is the number one ad, pre premium CD conversion service. Um, and then you can see there are all these other ads, these top three across the top, those are all paid um, paid placements. Those people are paying to be there. And down the right hand side, those people are paying to be there also. Um, and then the white part below 
below the box, that's where the organic uh, search results start. So in the, in the white box at the bottom, that's that's what those are organic search results. Those are ranked by relevance according to Google and their algorithm. Um, and getting to the top of Google organically is the work of, of SEO consultants. Um, and then the, the paid search results are, those are determined by what's called an ad rank. And we're going to get into what that is uh, more. But it's, it's really, it's a, it's a bid. It's a price you say, I'm willing to pay X amount of dollars per click or X amount of cents per click. Um, and it's multiplied by a quality score. So, so Google's taking into account how relevant they think your ad is. Um, because in the past, people have kind of spammed Google. I'm sure you've seen ads that were completely irrelevant to what you were searching for. And they were just bidding on very high traffic keywords and playing a numbers game. So when we advertise on AdWords, uh, what we set up is what we call a campaign. Um, and this is kind of the way a campaign is structured. Um, at the campaign level, which is a very high level, this is where we do geographic targeting, um, where you can tell Google that I'm advertising nationwide, or I'm advertising worldwide, or I'm advertising in Arizona, or all the way down to I'm advertising in just Chandler, Arizona. Um, you can also tell it what language, what your budget is. Um, you can target by device. Um, we're going to get more into how you set this up, but, but all the major settings are set up at the campaign level. And then under the campaign, you set up different ad groups. Um, and an ad group is kind of a subset of, of your campaign. It's hard to explain um, what an ad group is. I, I like to think of it as an, as an ad group is a, is a, camp, a mini campaign targeted at a specific t kind of customer. So um, if you're selling red shoes, um, you might have an ad group that is red running shoes and it's targeted at runners and you have red soccer shoes that are targeted at soccer players um, and then each ad group has the three critical components of an AdWords campaign which are your text ads, your keyword list, and your keyword bids. So you get an ad, you've got what keywords you want that ad to show for and how much you're willing to pay per click for those. Is everyone okay up to now? Okay, like I said, this is very dry compared to uh, design. All right, now we're into campaign setup. Um, I'm actually going to exit and go into a live campaign setup and show you guys just how this is. If you're going to set up an AdWords campaign, this is what you would do. Um, that's not what I want. And my internet is slow. All right. Okay. Um, the first settings that, that you can pick are location and languages. Um, this is again for Rip Styles, the service that, that rips your CDs and turns them into MP3s. Um, we're, here we're targeting English speakers in the United States. It's a nationwide um, business. However, if I'm a local business and my internet is slow, okay. Fail. Okay, if I'm a local business, I can do. Uh, oh, this is bad. It's going to take a minute. Basically, what this is going to allow me to do is I can pick a state to advertise in, I can pick a, a metro area to advertise in. If I am an attorney and I deal with people in the Phoenix metro, I can only advertise in Phoenix metro. I can only advertise in a specific city um, within the Phoenix metro. And this is all determined by um, IP address. So wherever your IP says you are. So it, it usually works well. Um, you get a couple of issues. Sometimes if you use AT&T air cards, they always think you're in Dallas, Texas. I don't know why. Have you ever noticed if you, if you Google something fr from an AT&T air card, it all, always comes with Dallas, Texas ads. There's a Starbucks by my house in Mesa that always thinks I'm in Los Angeles. I'm not sure why, but it's just where it is. This is not going to work for me. So. We'll keep going. So you can, you can do language. You can advertise Google AdWords all over the world. Um, you, know, you can do French, Spanish, whatever. Um, and then the next block lets you target by networks. And I hope this blows up for me. Okay. So for your networks, you have the option of, of 
the two big categories are search or display. Display, like I said, is this network of content sites. Um, I always choose not to, to advertise on display at first. And if I'm going to advertise on display later, I'll set up a, a separate campaign that is only for display so I can track those results separately because it'll perform very different than a search ad. I don't want to confuse the two. Um, and within search, you've got two different options. You've got Google Search, which is only on Google's homepage, um, or you've got Google Partner Search, which is Google and some smaller search engines that use Google results. So Ask.com uses Google results, AOL uses Google results. Um, so you can choose whether or not you want to show up for those. Uh, as a general rule, I usually start out with just Google Search because I know the, the quality is pretty good of the the, the results I get, and then once I prove something out on Google search results, I'll expand by, by showing it on all these other engines. Um, you can also target by device. Um, so I'm set up for this campaign to target only desktop and laptop computers. However, Google will let you target iPhones and mobile devices, um, and pretty soon they're going to let you target tablets. Um, the issue is Usually the default is, the, is to target everything because Google wants to take your money more than they want you to be profitable on your AdWords campaign. So they'll opt you into everything out there and it won't work and then everyone quits. So I'm going to show you some tricks to, to not fall into that trap. Um, whether or not you, you advertise on iPhones kind of depends on your product and what your goal is. If you're trying to sell a product that there's a, a massive checkout like a checkout, uh, like your shopping cart requires a lot of information, it needs to be typed. Usually you will, your cart abandonment rate on a, on a mobile device will be very large. Um, if you're trying to get a lead to fill out a whole bunch of information, if it's more than a couple of lines, you're going to lose them on, a, on, a, on an iPhone probably. Um, so if someone's trying to buy something that requires a lot of information or you're trying to get a form filled out that's, that's more than a couple lines, I generally only do desktops and laptops. Um, but there are instances where iPhones and mobile devices uh, work really well. If, if you have a business where people, you make sales by people calling in. Um, I was just doing, uh, I'm doing a, a joint project with another company that does like DUI attorneys. Someone gets pulled over for DUI, they get on their phone, they need an attorney. Um, you can actually put the phone number right in the Google ad and the person can click the phone number, not the ad headline, and it will dial that attorney for them. So in a case like that where your, your customers are calling and that's how you make your sale, that's a good way, a good opportunity to use iPhones and other mobile devices. Um, you can set your, your bidding options. Um, Actually, it's not going to come up for me. Basically, Google lets you do a couple of things. They let you just manually tell it how much you want to pay per click, which is the way I always do it, or it will try and optimize things for you. I always opt out of Google trying to optimize anything for me because just from experience, Google makes decisions based on way too little data for me. I like to kind of let everything run for a couple of weeks and then look at the statistics and see which, which way is actually better. Um, they'll also try and and focus on conversions on your website. Um, so they will, they will bid however much it takes to maximize the number of conversions, which generally means they'll, they'll bid a ton of money and deplete your budget very quickly <laughs> because they have no idea how much money you're making on those conversions. You can set a budget in here. Um, Google will tell you whether your budget's okay or not. Right now it tells me $50 a day for this campaign is okay. If I put in $5 a day, um, Google would tell me my budget's okay. Even though I spend more than that every day on this campaign, that's odd. Usually if it's too low, Google will tell you it's too low and you're going to miss out on clicks. Because basically if you hit your budget at noon, your ads don't show for the whole rest of the day. So you want to sell, set your budget high enough that, that, you can, that you'll get clicks all day long eventually. Um, for delivery methods, you can kind of pick whether you want Google to show your ads accelerated, which is as fast as they can show them. If I've got a keyword that a lot of people search for, um, if I do accelerated, anytime Google can show my ad, they'll show it. Um, the other option is standard, which they show it kind of evenly over time. They say you've got $50 uh, for a budget. Normally, if you ran this thing accelerated, it would, we'd spend $100 a day. So I'm only going to show it for every other query. And I want to space that out. That way you don't lose at the end of the day when maybe you've got a lot of buyers at the end of the day. Um, 
As a general rule, I'll start out standard to see if there are any patterns based on what people buy. There are certain products that people will just won't buy. Um, like they won't, if they won't buy at work maybe, and then they'll go back at home, they'll log in their computer and they'll buy there. Um, so you don't want to show your ad to a bunch of people in the morning who aren't going to buy and then not get them back at night. Um, so generally I'll do a test and then once I prove that something is feasible, then I'll go in and, and make it accelerated because if, if I trade a dollar in clicks for a dollar fifty in profit every time, I want to do that as many times as I can. So once I get it to the point where, where I've got a positive return on investment, then I, I turn it to accelerated and, and try to get as many clicks as I can. Um, and we won't go through the rest of this um, because it's just, it's getting, it's too advanced. You, you can set your, your ad to only show certain hours of the day if you'd like to. If you have certain, um, certain types of products that sell really well at night or in the morning or maybe on the weekends, then you can only show your ad during those times possibly. Usually find that out by doing a standard, running it standard and finding out that, hey, people only buy this product on Saturdays and Sundays and it's not profitable to run it during the week or something like that. There are very few products like that, but I found sites like Resume, I did, I did a campaign for a company that they're trying to collect resumes of, of people and uh, every Monday people would come back to work, they'd be pissed off and they'd post a resume. That's how, kind of how it would work and you'd look at the, the, the chart and every Monday would be the highest day. Sunday would be up a little, Monday and then Tuesday a little bit and, they would, and then Thursday, Friday they're just like, well this sucks but I'm just going to put up with it. And the next Monday they'd be pissed and they'd post their resume again. So that's kind of how it, how it worked. So at the end of all this, you fill out all these things, um, and then you need to set up an ad group. Is everybody with me so far? Okay. Any questions at all? Okay. Oh, Brandon. Um, basically, I'm looking for, um, and I'll get into the sales funnel in a minute, uh, but basically there's, there's a value of a visitor to your site. You know, you sell something for $150 and $50 of that's profit, you're going to convert X number of those and you can figure out that a visitor to your site is worth whatever it's worth. It could be worth a visitor to your site could be worth 50 cents. Um, well, if I run this standard to kind of get a, a, an idea of what it looks like over the course of a whole day and I find out that I can buy these clicks for 30 cents all day long and I can make 50 cents on every on average on every customer that I'm trading 30 cents for 50 cents on, on every click over time and I want to do that as often as I possibly can so I'll kind of I'll optimize things um, at standard first and once they're optimized then I kind of blow them out then I make my my budget huge because I don't want to give up if I'm making 50 cents, if I'm trading 30 cents for 50 cents, I don't want to give up any opportunity to not be able to do that. Question. Um, in terms of uh, making the decision on uh, where you want to set your price, are, are you looking for like a, an R, excuse me, a rate of return on investment? Yes. A specific one in particular that you're looking for? No, well, I'll get into it later. You can kind of set it, it varies by product. Um, yeah, I like to see 30 to 50 percent return on investment. Um, but yeah, we'll get into we'll get into bidding strategy um, later on in the presentation. But yeah. Okay, so now we're going to set up our first ad group. Um, and so the the components of an ad group, like I said before, are you have an ad, you've got a list of keywords that you want your ad to show for, and you've got bids. How much am I willing to pay per click for these? So. In the, in, in the ad group setup screen, we create our ads and we enter our keywords. <coughs> the first thing I start with is my keyword, not my ad. Um, and this is usually the hardest part for people is, you know, what keywords do I, am, am I going to try and target? Um, and this is the kind of the steps I go through is I identify my ideal prospect. And we're going to go through that on the next slide. Who is my ideal person that I want to see this ad that I think will buy whatever I've got to buy. Um, and then we do keyword research on you know, what keywords fit that, that buyer. Um, take a look at what the competition's like. Um, 
use proper match types, and that doesn't make any sense right now, but I'll get into match types. Um, use negative keywords. Um, we're going to get into that more too. That's keywords that you don't want your ad to show for. And um, keeping your ad groups tightly targeted. So if I sell running shoes that are red, I want all the running stuff in one, in one ad group. And I want, if I'm selling ballet shoes that are red, I want to keep all the ballet shoes in one, in one ad group. Uh, because Google likes that, and Google will reward you with cheaper clicks for that. Okay, so getting started with uh, coming up with a keyword list and thinking of our ideal prospect. It usually helps to write down, uh, physically write down on paper, and I do this, what, who your ideal prospect is. So I did this for the, the company Rip Styles, and I said for Rip Styles, my ideal prospect is someone who has a large collection of CDs, uh, recently purchased an MP3 player, and wants someone else to convert CDs to MP3s for them. That's very different than someone who just bought an MP3 player. It's different than someone who has a lot of CDs. It's different than someone who has a lot of CDs and an MP3 player that's willing to make the conversion themselves. I don't, that's not my ideal um, prospect. My ideal prospect wants, to, wants someone else to do it and is willing to pay someone else to do it. Um, and then write down a list of 10-ish keywords that you believe the about one in three people searching that search term would be your ideal prospect. If that makes sense. And that's got to be kind of a gut feel. But it keeps you from fishing these way out, um, you know, these way out keywords that, that you know, people are going for that they think are complementary products or things like that. Those generally don't work really well from an ROI perspective. Okay, so we've got a rough list of these 10 keywords. Um, I've just got two here. So we've got CD ripping and CD ripping service. And I put them into, this is Google's keyword tool. And you get there by, in AdWords, you go to reporting and tools and it's called the keyword tool. And you put your keyword um, or your keyword phrases into that box right there. And you can, you can tell it what your location is and what language um, you're looking for. And you just hit search. And it will generate all these keywords that it thinks are applicable. This is what Google would say is applicable. Um, and so this will generate more keyword ideas for you. Not all of these keywords will be applicable. You've really got to kind of vet these out and figure out what works for your business and what doesn't. Um, but it does give you a relative competition by this bar. So relative competition tells you how many other ads are going to show for that um, that keyword. So if the, your bars are all maxed out, that's probably going to be a pretty expensive keyword. And if your bar just has a little bit of competition, those are usually cheaper keywords per click. And then the far right hand column tells you how many monthly searches there are for that search term. So it kind of gives you an idea of how much volume there is. Usually higher volume search terms have higher competition, but that's not always the case. A lot of times you can find, um, you know, if you go, they call longer tail keywords, and maybe three or four keywords in a string, you still have a lot of people searching for that, and you can get them pretty cheap because other advertisers haven't thought of them. The other thing you can do in the keyword tool is you can put your website homepage, in, and Google can tell you what it thinks your website's about, and it can generate keyword ideas. So if I type in ripstyles.com, which is the homepage, it tells me all these keywords it thinks are related. Um, you, so you can generate some keywords this way because you may not be ranking organically for all these keywords. And it also gives a good gut check to see if Google thinks, if what Google thinks your site is about is what you think your site's about. Because sometimes there are discrepancies and if there's a discrepancy you want to fix that. <laughs> Alright, after we've got kind of a more expanded keyword list, um, you can dump all this stuff into Google's traffic estimator, which is in that exact same reporting and tools uh, menu. It's just called a traffic estimator. You dump your keywords in. You tell it roughly how much you will pay per click, you're willing to pay per click, and what your daily budget is. And you set your, your geographic and language targets, and then when you run it, it'll crank out how many searches there are globally, how many searches there are in your local area where you're choosing to advertise. It gives you an estimated cost per click to be in the number one spot. Um, for that, if you put in other bids, like five dollars is pretty high, it'll put me in the number one spot most of the time. If I put in 50 cents, it would tell me 
pretty much what I'd expect a pay-per-click for each keyword and what my average position on the page would be. One being the top, the top three right underneath the search box and then down four starting at the top of the right-hand side and all the way down. We'll get into rankings uh, in a couple of slides here. And then it, it cranks out what the average daily cost would be. So for these four keywords, if I was going to run these at $5 a click, I'm not going to get clicks every day, but every day I should plan to spend about $12.32. This is not always accurate. Google's way off sometimes in these things, but it's a, it's a pretty good way to, to kind of get a rough idea of what you'd be paying. Is everyone with me still? Is the speed okay? It's faster, slower? All right. Okay, so now we've got these keywords. We know about what they're going to cost us. We know um, how many times people search for them every month on average. Um, now we're going to get into matching options. This is after wrong targeting because Google opts you into everything. This is the second biggest mistake I see people make. This is a mistake that, that costs people tons of money. When, I see, when people say, I just spent $1,000 on AdWords and I didn't get any sales, AdWords doesn't work. It usually comes down to keyword matching. Um, so there is a, a huge difference between red shoes, if I'm selling red shoes, there's a difference between red shoes by itself, which they call a broad match, red shoes in quotes, which they call a phrase match, and red shoes in brackets, which they call an exact match. Um, the broad match, uh, if you bid on the broad match, which when I see everyone bids on all broad match keywords, they dump them all in and they get garbage back. I put in the red, red shoes as a broad match. I can show ads for red shoes like I want to, but I can also show them for just the word red, just the word shoes. I can show for green shoes because it has the word shoes in it. Broad match only requires that one of the words in my string is in the, uh, uh, is in the search query. It can search for red rocks, red rider BB gun, anything. So um, that's how you get a lot of people that are just kind of seeing an interesting ad and clicking around and costing you a whole bunch of money that never intended on buying whatever you have to sell. <laughs> um, a step better than that is phrase match, um, which means that both the term red and the term shoes have to be in the query. Um, so this is really good because it'll come up with longer keyword phrases that you may have never thought of. Um, so it shows for red shoes like you wanted to. It shows for Nike red shoes. It shows for buy red shoes, red running shoes. But red and shoes have to be in, um, in the, the, uh, the keyword string. And then the, the most targeted you can do is exact match, which is red shoes. It will only show for red shoes. Um, so the phrase match and exact match, I use pretty much, I never do broad match. Um, I only do phrase and exact match when I set these things up. Um, and, and I do that to keep your, your click through rate and your ROI high. Um, we're going to get into quality score a little later and that's how Google views the quality of your ads. And one of the components of quality score is your click through rate. That's for every 10 times or for every 100 times your ad is displayed, how many people click on it. Um, and you know, if, so if, if it's one out of every 10 times, you have a click-through rate of 10%. That's considered good. If you do broad match and you're showing for all these search terms that n you, know, you never intended to, they've got nothing to do with your product, your click-through rate will be pretty low. And if your click-through rate is below, I think it's 0.1% on the first 1,000 clicks, Google will drop your ad just and say it's no good and you'll be done from the beginning. Um, so you can get around that by, by phrase matching and exact matching. Um, the other kind of match you can do is called a negative match, where you can add negative keywords. Um, this is the screen from, that we looked at from, the, um, from Google's keyword tool. So we put in CD ripping and CD ripping service and it, it, it came up with all these different things, all these different terms that it thinks may be relevant to our site. Well, a couple of things I see in here, I see CD burning software. Um, we don't want to show for that because remember we're a service that takes people's CDs, burns them, we do the burning, we put it on your iPod, we ship everything back. Um, so <laughs> rip it. Rip it. Um, so we, we, we don't sell software so we don't want to show for software because someone who's looking for CD ripping software probably has no intention of paying someone to rip their CDs for them. Um, DVD burner, we don't sell DVD burners so we wouldn't want to show for that. So. Um, so I can put in negative match for the word software and burner and I can show if I do a phrase match for CD ripping, 
Um, I'll show up for CD ripping service, but I won't show up for CD ripping software. That makes sense. Or CD ripping hardware. I can make this whole list of, of keywords that don't pertain to my business that I don't want to show for. So negative keywords are another way to get your click through rate up because you're only showing ads to people that are interested in, in exactly what you're buying. That's why it's so important to, to figure out who your target customer is um, on the front end. All right, the other way you can, get ne you can get negative keywords are once your ad's actually running, if you're looking at your ad's keywords, um, there is a little box that says see search terms. And you can look at exactly what, people what, exactly what people typed into the search box to get to your ad, to get to your site. Um, and there you find a couple of different things. Um, you find a lot of things that you didn't want to, you, you didn't know, you didn't want to, to match for, but you didn't know you didn't want to match for. So initially we had, we showed for CD ripping hardware. We don't sell that. Um, so afterwards, I go in and I add a negative match for hardware. Then there's this weird vortex box, something, something, automatic CD ripping. So I added a negative match for vortex box. I don't, somebody typed that in one person. Um, actually, four people searched for it. I had four impressions for that. I don't want to show for that. So I added those as to, to my negative match. So in terms of an overall strategy for building your keyword list, um, we start with that a small group of 10 to 20 words. We, we kind of expand it with Google's keyword tools. Um, we use only phrase and exact match to start. Um, and then we monitor our, our results and what people are actually typing in to get to our site. Um, and we add negative keywords where appropriate. We may also find keyword strings that we wanted. Um, like, uh, I can't even think, or like CD ripping company. People were, Instead of service, customers were calling it a CD ripping company. Well, we didn't think to, to, to bid on CD ripping company, but knowing that people were, we'll go in now and add as an exact match CD ripping company. Um, and then repeat, repeat, repeat. So we're constantly going through and we're deleting keywords that don't apply and adding keywords that do apply and the, this keyword list is growing over time. As the keyword list grows, the number of clicks grow. Um, and as long as they're profitable, then our profits grow. Okay, the last part of setting up ad groups is to keep ads, uh, keep ad groups tightly targeted. These are two different ad groups. They're both for the same company, Rip Styles. Um, the one on, the, on your right is the original, what they had originally set up. They came to me because they, um, they weren't getting a return on their AdWords campaign. And the way their campaign was set up, they had, they had a campaign with one ad group and then like 375 keywords in this ad group. Um, Google gave those ads a low quality score and the next thing we're going to do is get into quality scores because they were kind of so all over the place. If, you're, if your keywords in your ad group are all over the place, Google kind of figures that you don't really know what you're doing. Um, so they reward people who they think know what they're doing by creating these very tight ad groups, this very tight keyword list because they, they think it means that you know your customer better. Um, so I pulled out for CD ripping, very specific keywords that were CD ripping, CD ripping service, best CD ripping service, um, things like that, and had this list of only about 10 keywords, 12 keywords, and that's an ad group. And then for music conversion, which is like over here someplace, we'll have a separate ad group for music conversion, music conversion service, and CD to MP3, um, and these are all different ad groups. The big question is why do we do this? No one in it really understands um, Google secret sauce that they come up with it, but through experimentation we can learn a couple of things. Google assigns to each keyword a quality, a quality score and it's, what, it's, it's Google's way of keeping people from putting irrelevant ads up on keywords that just have a high search volume. Um, you've probably seen that there was, there was, there were some ads back in the day that always said like looking for blah you know, find it, whatever, it was like an eBay ad or something. It was like eBay.com slash whatever that was. They used a, this dynamic keyword insertion thing to like take any keyword that had high volume and, um, and insert it into their ads and, and show for that keyword. And I, I actually, someone sent me a picture once where it said, looking for God, if it was the headline, because someone typed God in as the keyword. It said, looking for God, find God at the best price, ebay.com slash God. <laughs> so 
Um, Google didn't want that happening, so they develop a quality score. And what a quality score takes into account is it's how relevant your keyword is to your ad text, how relevant your ad text is to your landing page, which is where people go from your ad and land, and how relevant your keyword is to your landing page. So it takes these three things into account, and it also takes into account your, the click-through rate of your ad over time. Because if you're showing an ad, if there are 10 ads on a page for red shoes, and people click your ad, their click-through rate's 25%, one in four people click your ad, Google figures that if people are clicking your ad, your ad must be pretty darn relevant to what they're looking for. You've got exactly what they want, that's a good ad. So over time, a high click-through rate will mean a higher quality score. And you can see what your quality score is um, by, in your keyword list, if you mouse over these little uh, conversation buttons or uh, boxes, it'll bring up, it'll tell you whether or not your keyword's showing and what that keyword is. Um, generally, seven out of 10 is considered good. Three, four, and under is considered bad. Um, and I, I'll show you exactly why, how quality score pays into this. So we talked about how when you want to show organically, Google just has this algorithm that says this is the most relevant site based on their algorithm. When you are showing in paid search ranking, Google calculates what it calls an ad rank. And these are the different ad positions on the page. So the number one position, the guy that has the number one ad is the one right below the search box. That generally gets the highest number of clicks. Um, then two and three are under him, and then four starts on the right-hand side and goes down. There are ads on the second page, those are beyond that. Sometimes it'll show you're in position 16, that means you're on the second page. Usually, you used to get eight ads on the first page of Google, now it's roughly 10 because they've done this crazy stuff where this used to be three lines, or this was the headline, and then this was the ad, and then this was your, your thing. Google's experimenting with putting the first line the first line of the body in line with your headline because Google can put more ads on a page and therefore make more money. <laughs> so, not that I'm against Google, they do everything to make money. So your ad rank is now determined, it, it used to just be the, in, the, in the good old days, or the bad old days I guess it was, ad rank went to the highest bidder. So I don't, it doesn't matter how crappy my ad is, if I pay $10 a click, I'm number one. Um, and that's how we got on this whole, this whole thing with bad ads. And Google's all about customer, customer experience. So now your ad rank is your quality score times your bid. Um, so that those ads have a, a lower quality score. So if you have a lower quality score, to remain at number one, you have to bid higher than someone who has a higher quality score to get the same ad rank. So this is kind of how it works out. And I'm gonna get into some math here. I hope I don't lose people. If you fall asleep, I, I won't blame you. <laughs> but this is, this is just kind of how, how the system works. So we've got three advertisers, all advertising the same for the same keyword. So you got advertiser A, B, and C. Um, let's say they're all trying to advertise red shoes, and <clears throat> advertiser A bids 75 cents, and their quality score is seven based on their ad and their landing page. Advertiser B bids 50 cents a click, same keyword, and has a quality score of 10. Advertiser C bids a dollar click, and they have a quality score of four. Okay, so they have a, not a very good ad, not a very good landing page, it's not really relevant to the keyword, so. <clears throat> um, to get the, the ad rank, we just multiply the, the bid times the quality score, so um, advertiser A ends up with, with 5.25, advertiser B adds up with five, and advertiser three ends up with C, or, sorry, with C, with three. <laughs> Um, so the guy with the highest ad rank goes to position one. So advertiser A bids 75 cents and now he's in position one, top of the page. Advertiser B, 50 cents, he's in position two, and advertiser C is in position three. Even though advertiser C bid the most money, so they had the worst ad, they're in position three. Um, so what this kind of does is it, it helps the people who are willing to work at getting relevant and improving their quality score, it gives them an, ad, an edge over the big companies with the deep pockets that can just throw money at this thing. So it kind, of, it kind of levels the playing field. Now the big question is, okay, so advertiser A is in first, first place, B's in second place, C's in third place, these guys all have these different bids. What are these guys actually gonna pay for a click? 
So here's the formula. This is where it gets. This is where people are going to fall asleep. Um, the, how much will I actually pay for a click? Um, this is something, if you're going to hire somebody to do a pay-per-click campaign for you, the two things that you want to ask them before you hire them is, A, what is the role of Google Quality Score in raking my ads? And B, how do I calculate what my actual cost per click is going to be? Because a lot of people don't know this, but if you don't know this, it's very difficult to optimize a campaign for return on investment without knowing how much you're going to pay. So the, the formula is your actual cost is the, the ad rank of the position, the ad of the position below you. So it's that, the ad below you, you take their quality score and their bid, multiply them together, their ad rank, divided by the quality score of your ad, and then you add a penny. It seems really, really messed up, but it, it always seems to work out, and it's always below whatever you're bidding. Um, so we'll look at advertisers A, B, and C again, what they're actually going to pay. So advertiser A is in position one. Their ad rank was, was 5.25, but we're going to look at, at advertiser B's ad rank to calculate their cost. So advertiser B's ad rank was 5. Um, and we're going to divide that by advertiser A's quality score, which is 7. And you get 5 divided by 7 um, is 71 cents plus 1 cent, 72 cents. So advertiser A bids 75 cents. They're actually going to pay 72 cents a click um, in this, this auction for this ad space. Advertiser B is going to pay advertiser C's rank score divided by their own quality score of 10 plus a penny. So they're going to they're gonna pay 3, which is advertiser C's um, ad rank, divided by 10, 30 cents plus a penny, 31 cents is what they're going to pay. They bid 50, they're going to pay 31. Advertiser C, there was no advertiser D. So um, I extrapolated that advertiser D may have a, an ad rank. It's going to definitely be lower than 3. So I just said, theoretically, advertiser D's got an ad rank of somewhere in the neighborhood of 2.5. Um, and they're going to pay 2.5 divided by 4, which is their quality score, um, and add a penny, which is 64 cents for the third position. You see what's really, really cool here is the, what does anyone else, does anyone else see anything that's really cool here? <laughs> I'll ask you guys. Yeah, advertiser B is paying less than advertiser C and they get a higher, higher placement. Exactly. Advertiser B is paying 31 cents to be in position two. Advertiser C is paying 64 cents to be in position three. That is the role, that is how important your, your Google quality score is to, um, to being profitable in AdWords. Because it's a lot easier to be profitable spending 31 cents a click than it is to spend 64 cents a click. And being in position two as opposed to position three, advertiser B is probably going to get more clicks over time than advertiser C is. Just gonna keep it keeps improving their quality score and it's an endless cycle until you get to 10. And for advertiser C, it's, it's a cycle the other way. Your quality score is either going up or it's going down, generally. So you get better and better or worse and worse. So, I don't know, so advertiser A is paying 72 cents to be in position one. What happens if advertiser A uh, gets their quality score to 10 by making their ad more relevant, their, pay, their landing page more relevant? Um, so here's their baseline. It all cranks out to 72 cents. If we optimize um, their ad and their landing page, they get a quality score of 10. Now their ad rank becomes uh, 750. Um, the ad rank below them stays the same. It was 5 for um, advertiser B. So 5 divided by their new quality score of 10 is 50 cents plus a penny is 51 cents. So instead of paying 72 cents, now these guys are paying 51 cents a click for the first position on the page. Advertiser C is paying 64 cents a click for the third position on the page. So these guys get first position on the page and 29.2% reduction in cost, which is only 29 cents. But a lot of these advertisers do, you know, a thousand, you know, if you do a thousand dollars worth of clicks a day, you're saving $290. So it can save you a lot of money if you do big volume. So the question is, how do I achieve a high quality score? Um, and like I said, you can keep your ad groups tightly targeted. That's where Google thinks that you know your customer very well. I'm also going to show you when you're writing ads, um, 
it's easy to make your ad relevant if you have a small group of keywords. Um, if you have a huge group of keywords, it's kind of all over the place, it's hard to make an ad that's relevant to all those keywords uh, at the same time. <clears throat> so if you divide them up into ad groups, different ad groups, small keywords, you can make a highly targeted ad for each ad group and each, each group of keywords um, that Google will give you a high quality score for. Um, write targeted ads, we're going to look at, at ad, uh, ad writing here in a second, and um, landing page relevance. Um, you want to make sure that your your landing page has your keyword in it, but not to the point where it looks like you're doing it on purpose. <laughs> As a general rule, I, I, Google likes, a lot of people shoot for like 5 to 7% range of keyword density on a page. I don't worry about it too much. I just write an ad, ad or landing page that I feel is good, and it's got the keyword several times in it. Okay, so writing targeted ads. Um, these are kind of the, the rules of writing an ad that Google thinks is targeted. Um, you can write the best ad in the world from a, I mean, there are lots of, like, creative people, they write ads that they try and um, invoke certain emotions and things like that. Google doesn't have emotions, it's just an algorithm. So these are kind of the things, this is how you write ads for a robot. Um, include the keywords in your ad text. Um, and I'll show you that in just a minute, what that looks like. Um, and I'll actually, give, I'll give you a tip on this. I've tried this a million different ways. I've done a lot of, of experimenting, and I found the best, I get the best quality scores when I use the keywords in the ad title once, once within the ad body text, and once within the display URL. So that's three times. If you do it more than that, Google thinks you're trying to scam them, and if you do it less than that, you just appear to be not as relevant as the other ads you're competing with. Um, the next thing is include a differentiator. Um, something that differentiates you from the other ads on the page. This can be like free shipping or um, any kind of like $10 off your first purchase, something like that that makes your ad stand out from your competitors. Um, include a, a call to action or a call to action if appropriate. If you're trying to get people to buy something or to fill out a form or to sign up, it can say like sign up now. Like kind of tell them what, what to do when they get to this page. Um, if appropriate, don't make it seem too scammy like, like buy now, buy now, buy now, you know, this whatever. It ends Friday, Friday, Friday. It's not a monster truck rally. Um, and then choose, uh, choose the right landing page. You can, um, and by choose the right landing page, I mean, do you want to send people from your ad to your home page, or you don't want to send them to a page that's got multiple, like a family of products to choose from at different price points, or to a specific product? And it's going to depend on your product, and we'll go through that too. Okay, so using keywords and ads. This is actually from the keyword CD to MP3 um, that we typed, we typed this into Google, and these are the top two ads. The number one ad, actually, I wrote for RipStyles, and um, if you notice, the, the search terms, if your search terms are in your ad, they're bolded by Google, which makes your ad stand out from other ads that don't have, search term, don't have the search terms in them. So one of the biggest ways to get your click-through rate up is to have your, your keywords in your ad, so they're bolded. Um, as you can see, this is, so CD to MP3 is, is once in the title. That extension is actually the first line of the body. Has CDs, which Google knows is the same as CD, to MP3 in it. Um, it's got a differentiator, shipping kit included. Other you know, companies, you may have to sh pay for shipping, but we're going to include it. It's a shipping kit. We ship it to you and whatever. Um, it also tells you price, $1 per disk. It gives people kind of a comparison on the page. Um, so they're not expecting to be free or 20 cents or something. They know what they're going to pay when they click your ad. Um, and what else is going to show And I, I don't have it on this ad. I don't, but I'm going to add it in. It, the, the display URL is, is ripstyles.com. When you set up an ad in AdWords, you have what's called, what, you have a display URL and you have an actual destination URL. The display URL is what the people see in your ad. The destination is where they actually go. So if I'm Home Depot and I'm selling hedge trimmers and I send people to a hedge trimmer page, I may not want my display URL to be something super long, like Home Depot dot com slash lawn and garden slash power tools slash hedge trimmers because that kind of throws people off. I could have it just say homedepot.com and then I could have the long real URL of my landing page in the, the actual URL that no one can see. But what Google will let you do is you can put a display URL in that 
isn't a real display URL, and as long as the main URL is right is the same, Google will let you get away with it. So these guys in the second position actually have CD2 slash CD2 MP3 um, in their thing. This may not be a real page; it may just go to this page, but Google will allow you to show this, and it will bold this, and it will be reflected in your ad rank, which is interesting. It's kind of a loophole. It's a trick. So if you want to get your, your quality score up, you can add a fake extension that has your keywords in it. I don't know how long that will be available, but you can do it right now. <laughs> That's a good trick. I'll give you guys a couple of tricks. All right, and the last part is choose the right landing page. Are you going to send people from your ad to your home page? Are you going to send them to what they call deep linking, to a product? Um, and as a general rule, I say the fewest, the fewest clicks to achieve a conversion is the best. If people have to click around you know, through multiple steps to get to a product to buy it. You have a, a lot of opportunities to lose them. If you send them right to where they can buy it, usually it's the best, unless you have a product where you really need to educate the consumer first. Um, and then you may need some sort of a, an educational page before the actual sales page. So here's an example. If I'm looking for hedge trimmers and I go to a Home Depot ad, this is a Home Depot homepage. Do I want to go here, or do I want a deep link to hedge trimmer here? I will bet a lot of money <laughs> that this page right here converts at a much higher rate than sending people to this page right here. Does that make sense? Okay. A lot of people send people to their, a lot of advertisers send people to their homepage, and then when people get there, they're kind of like, all right, where do I go from here? I got to go into another search box and type the same words into another search box. It's just a waste. Okay, everyone okay up to writing ads, quality scores, ad ranks? Everyone still with me? Okay. Um, the last piece is your keyword bidding strategy. How do you decide how much you're willing to pay for a to, for a keyword, you know, what makes sense. You can always get to position one in Google. I can say I'm going to pay $100 a click, but if I pay $100 a click for 10 clicks, it costs me 1000 bucks, and I sell one Matchbox car that I made 30 cents on, my ROI is pretty piss poor. So, um, to figure out what you're going to bid, you need to know what a visitor is worth to your site. And that's what a lot of web people know this. Um, People that are doing SEO know this generally, but I deal with people that own like flower shop or something like that that don't, it just, this is not the way they think. What's, what's a visitor worth? And you can actually, if you have enough data, put a value to a visitor on your site. Um, and using that, you can calculate what your break even is. If I bid this amount, I know I can at least break even. And then you set an ROI target. So you tell yourself, you ask yourself, how much do I want to make on my, how much profit do I want to make on my advertising? I'm going to bring in, I know I'm going to bring in additional revenue. How much margin do I want there to be on that additional revenue? All right, so what are visitors worth? Let's say my, my average sale is I'm selling something. I'm selling, I sell red shoes. My average sale is two pairs of red shoes. And I don't know why I like red shoes. I don't even own red shoes. This guy, James, that runs 40, uh, the marketing agency, he wears red shoes, and, and I thought of him while I was putting this together. So your average order size is two pairs of red shoes, and um, that's revenue of $150 total. Um, then you got to take out your cost. So your materials, you know, what, are you, what are you buying those red shoes for? What are you paying the sweatshop in Vietnam to sew these red shoes for? Um, so your material, your labor, your shipping, if you're offering free shipping, you know, what's your shipping cost you? Take all that out. Let's say that's $100 to make these shoes and ship them to the customer. What's left over is your margin. So you make $50 profit in your pocket on every sale of, on the average sale of red shoes. All right, you can look, if, if you've got Google, how many people have used Google Analytics at all? All right, if you don't have analytics, you should get it. It's just code you paste in your website HTML, and it gives you information on things like, um, basically it goes on your thank you page, so you know, you know if someone's gotten your thank you page, they've purchased something. Um, and it, so it, it tells you, if 100 people came to my site, um, how many people got to the thank you page? 
two of them got the thank you page, two people bought, so your conversion rate's roughly 2%. Um, so let's say our conversion rate's 2%, two out of every 100 visitors to our site buy. So $50 a visitor um, times two, or $50 a sale times 2%, my visitor is worth a dollar. So every visitor that comes to my site, I'm going to make a dollar on, on average. Okay? That's your break even. So if I go out and bid a dollar a click, I pay a dollar for that click, on average, over time, I'm probably going to get a dollar back and I'm breaking even on my AdWords campaign. Make sense? All right. Now calculating what you want your, your max cost per click to be. This is where you, you, type, you, you come up with an ROI. So you know that each visitor is worth a dollar. You say, I want to make 50% ROI on my advertising dollars, okay? Um, so I'm going to bring, I want to bring a bunch of new business in because I'm not advertising on AdWords right now. It's only organic. Um, I want to bring this new business in. I don't want to do it for free where I'm just breaking even. I want to make something on this. I want to make 30% ROI on this money I'm going to spend, I'm going to pay Google. So all you do is take your $1 break even, and if you want to make 30 cents, you just take the one, it's actually not a dollar minus 30 cents, but it's, it's 100 minus 30%. So you're, you can pay 70% of that and get your 30% return. So our max bid is 70, 70 cents based on these round numbers. Here's a tip that I'll give you guys that I use all the time, and you'd be surprised at how well this works. I always bid two pennies above the round numbers. Why do I do this? Because I'd say 90% of the advertisers out there that are your competitors bid round numbers because people just love round numbers. People are like, I'm going to bid 50 cents a click. I'm going to bid 25 cents a click. I'm going to bid 70 cents a click. If you have, if you're competing on that same keyword, and your ad has the same quality score, you both have a quality score of seven, or you both have a quality score of 10, this two cents makes the difference between being in position one and being in position two. Does that make sense? And would you be willing to pay two more cents to be in position one versus position two? In most cases, I would. I mean, you're only talking about, you know, a three, not even 3% increase in your cost to be a whole position higher in Google. So I, I always bid two. There are some people that know this rule that bid one penny more. So I bid two pennies more. So I'm not, I'm not just trumping, you know, the, the average Joe. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trump him and the guy that thinks he knows what he's doing. There's probably someone bidding three cents more. <laughs> Once you get to five, it's like a round number again. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> so as a general rule, I always do two cents above. So I would go in with a max bid of 72 cents. When you, when you actually have these ads run, you, you'll sometimes pay your max cost per click. Generally, you will pay less than that. Almost always, the way that the pricing model works out, you'll pay less. So if I bid 72 cents, I probably won't even pay 70 cents a click. I might pay 68, 69 cents a click anyway. But I got a higher position than the guy bidding 70. Okay, and so now that we got that, it's in the campaign optimization. So we've got a campaign. The campaign's running. We know we've got an ad. We've got keywords. We know exactly how much we're willing to pay for those keywords, and we turn this thing on. And this is kind of, this is this, like the sales funnel on the internet. So you've got, at the top level, impressions is like this whole universe. An impression is any time your ad was shown. So someone typed in a search and your ad showed up on Google. That's an impression. One issue with impressions is if your ad shows what they call below the fold, where you can't see it when the page comes up, but you need to scroll down to see it, and people don't scroll, it was still an impression. If the ad loaded, Google counts it. Um, That's not really an issue, though, by the way, anymore. People, it used to be mm -hmm. that below the fold is considered like, you know, not a good yep. space, but that's not as... I mean, People scroll more, yeah. But your click-through rate will be lower down there, below the fold. Um, so, so you've got impressions. That anytime it loads, it counts as an impression. Well, yeah, whether it's, it's an issue or not. But yeah, it'll, it'll be an impression. Um, now you funnel from all these people down to who actually clicks on your ad and goes to your website. And getting from impressions to clicks, that's your click-through rate. So about, out of 1,000 impressions, 100 people clicked. Your click-through rate is 10%. And then from your clicks, visitors to your site, how many of those actually convert to a sale or to a lead or whatever your goal is? That's your conversion rate. So if you have a problem that you can't get enough impressions, like you're only getting a few impressions, generally you need to add more keywords. More keywords will give you more impressions. If 
As a general rule, if your problem is your click-through rate is low, you need to optimize your ads, your ads, your bids. Um, and if your conversion rate is low, you need to optimize your landing page. You have a problem with people get there, but they, um, once they're there, they don't do what you want them to do. So let's say your conversion rate is low. Let's say it's you know, less than 1%, or your click-through rate, let's say it's less than 1%, and you want to get it up. Um, here are some things that you can do. The biggest thing you can do is work on your quality score. Um, and you can do this by a couple of things. Uh, by, to improve your ad, generally what I, I'll do first is I'll split test my ad copy. Um, Google allows you to have multiple ads and you can tell Google that I want to run these ads 50% each. And I'll run two ads that are slightly different next to each other for a week. And the one with the highest click-through rate I'll keep. And the one with the lower click-through rate I'll cut. And then I'll write another ad. And I'll run those for a week. And the one with the highest click-through rate I'll keep. And then with the lower click-through rate, I'll cut. And I'll do this over. And I'll do this maybe three times until like, eventually you get diminishing returns and you're kind of like, this is what my click-through rate's gonna be. Um, but you'll usually, at first, you'll see huge differences. If you change the ad title and it's different, you know, it's very different, you'll see a huge difference in click-through rates. So you can split test those and, and choose the better one. Um, you can adjust your keyword bids. Um, so maybe I, the problem is I am showing below the fold. I'm in position eight. And I'm below the fold on most monitors. No one's scrolling to see it. It's showing as an ad. It's showing as an impression, but it's not. I'm not getting any clicks because it's down there. Well, I can bid a little bit more and show, but that may not be profitable to bid more and pay more per click. So I always do that in conjunction with raising my quality score. Because if I raise my bid and raise my quality score, a lot of times those will cancel each other out and I can be higher up on the page for the same amount of money per click. Um, and the third thing, this is kind of a more advanced topic, but um, you can utilize position preference. And in your settings at the campaign level, Google will allow you to set position preference, which says, I only want my ad to show if it shows between positions one and three. Or I only want to show my ad if it shows position two and, and lower. And reasons why you do this are sometimes for some products, people win, like just they window shop. They price compare, they do all kinds of stuff. They'll click on the first ad first all the time, but they will buy at a very low rate clicking on the first ad. Um, and in those cases, maybe you don't want to be the first ad. So you will bid a high amount of money, but you'll tell Google the highest I want to show is two. That way, you could qualify for one, but Google will put you in two and they'll adjust everything to make it work. And, they'll, and they will price that ad for you being in position two, because you'll pay based on the guy's quality score in position three and your own quality score. Um, the other way you can use um, position preference is, if your click-through rate's low because you're off the page, and Google uses your click-through rate, your historical click-through rate, to calculate your quality score. A lot of times if I come in and I've got a low quality score because Google doesn't like the way my keyword, my ad mesh, but I think it's right, Google, I think Google just doesn't know what they're talking about and they don't sometimes, <laughs> not a lot, but sometimes. Um, what I'll do is I'll set a position preference for, I only want to show if my ad's in positions one through four. That way I know it's above the fold, I know it's right in front of the visitor's eyes. They always see one through three, it's the, below the box, their eyes are there. And usually they'll, they, 20, I think it's 28% of the time they'll look at the top, person, the top ad in the right hand column. So I know they're seeing this. I'll set it there, I will up my bid to where I'll break even, and I'll run these ads very, very high, and I'll let the click-through rate go from 0.5% to 5%. And when the click-through rate goes up like that, my quality score goes up. And when my quality score goes up, then I'll ratchet my bid back down to get to where I want to be. It's kind of a game, but, but you can use those things to, to, to improve your click-through rate. In that case, wouldn't it be better to restart an ad in another ad group? You can't, a lot of times it will, it will recognize the keyword. It's, it's the way Google looks at the past history of the keyword overall, and I think ads with your keyword in them, um, not necessarily your ad. I've, I've tried that, and I've ended up with the same, the same quality score. What's interesting is it takes your whole account history into account a little bit, where like, I will run an ad for a keyword in, in RIP styles in the, ad, in the account they set up, and I would get a low quality score because historically they had lower quality scores. I would set up the ad in my own account and Google right out of the gate would give me like a six where they get a three. Same ad, same keyword. It's weird, but Google looks at your account's overall history as well. 
So that's how you, that's how you improve your, your click-through rate. Your conversion rate, you can, you can also split test um, landing pages. So on those 50-50 ads, right, I'm showing one ad and then the next ad's different, and then the next ad's the first one, the next ad's different. You can have all the text the same, but you can change the landing page. Even the display URL can be the same, the actual URL you send people to. So you can test different landing pages, and then you can see which landing pages give you the better conversion rate. Um, you can also improve your call to action. There's a lot of on-screen on things. You can look in your analytics and see what pages people bounce from, what the bounce rates are. Shopping cart abandonment. Is your cart just too clunky, too hard to use? Um, and, and make improvements there. And that's it. So you build a campaign, ads, keywords, bids. You put it out there and you optimize it. Quality score, quality score, quality score. <laughs> is there, does anyone have any questions? Or does anyone feel like they know AdWords better now than they did an hour ago? <laughs> yeah. Any questions at all? Anything. All right, Ed. Is this your primary business? This is my primary business. So I, I run a company called Circle Stone Media. Um, I, I basically used to own an, on, an online retailer. And I did not have a whole lot of luck doing organic SEO to get in the search rankings for certain things. So I turned to AdWords and I had to kind of master AdWords to, um, to be able to, to sell my products. And after I kind of, just by trial and error, learned a bunch of tricks. I had friends that owned businesses, couldn't get any traffic. Hey, will you build an AdWords campaign for me? And it kind of, that happened. And I built an AdWords campaign one day um, for a company that had, they were using an ad agency, a full, full service agency that did a lot of offline advertising for them, newspapers, magazines, things like that. That agency saw their traffic spike and they told them, well, you know, we're doing this AdWords, this guy, Scott, and whatever. And so the agency sent me an email and they said, hey, we've got nine other customers you can do this for. How much do you charge? <laughs> I don't know. These guys are my friends. I was doing this kind of for free or like basing it on time and doing it for hours. So, um, so at that time, like I built a website, came with the pricing structure, quit my job, and, and I've been doing this full time since May. Just, just, I've been doing AdWords overall since 2006. So I've seen a lot of changes in Google since then. So there are particular types of customers you prefer? Um, my t I have a couple different types of customers. Um, one type of customer is uh, local customers that think that AdWords is only for huge, you know, um, nationwide um, retailers uh, that don't realize that you can actually compete with those guys and be profitable on a local level just by geographic targeting. Um, and I have a lot of people that have tried AdWords and failed miserably and just, they're like, because AdWords is one of those, it's one of those things that anyone can set up an account, anyone can, you know, put a keyword list together. Um, and when you, when, you first, when you blow your first thousand bucks and don't make any sales on it, then, then you uh, might decide to find someone to help you figure out what went wrong. So that's, most of my customers come from that, I would say. And most of my customers, a lot of customers come through full service ad agencies that they offer pay-per-click but don't really do pay-per-click and just outsource to me. That's the bulk of my business actually. Any other questions at all? Thank you, thank you.